Um, so, but before we start, I have to tell you a little bit about graph theory, which is, a, of course, mathematical theory. Um, and then uh, we can look at some properties of complex networks and, um, and maybe also look a little bit to these uh, symptom networks and in what way they actually uh, represent uh, a complex network or not. So, graph theory. Graph theory is a, a formal system, basically, that can be used to talk about compositions of vertices and edges. So, a lot of people are, get confused about this, but a vertice is actually a node, and an edge is a connection between nodes. So, I think I will just call them nodes, <laughs> which is also easier to pronounce sometimes also called a point. Um, so the connections between the nodes are the edges, or the lines, or the sides, or the branches, or the arrows. Uh, all right, and, 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 and composition actually means uh, topology. So a lot of the um, measures that you can get from these networks tell you something about the structure of the network. Um, but there is, of course, also yeah, networks might evolve, so that structure might change, so there are also um, ways to look at how uh, the structure of these networks changes over time. Okay, so, um, well, um, there are different ways to represent networks, of course, the, uh, or graphs. The most uh, known one is just make a picture, right? So we have nodes, we have edges. Uh, here we have uh, numbers for each node, so it's vertices for seven, vertices for vertex four, and then uh, edges usually also get uh, like an index. Um, you can also write it down like this. So uh, the vertices of the graph G are a collection of nodes V1 through V8, and the edges E1 through E18. And then you usually have a list of uh, these edges that tells you which nodes they connect to. Just a different way of writing this down. And this may actually be uh, the best way, or at least uh, uh, um, if you want to learn about how to uh, calculate things about these networks. Uh, that's the, the adjacency matrix. And uh, this just lists, so the, the columns are, uh, and the rows are the, the vertices, the nodes. And it, uh, if there's a one here, this means that there's an edge connecting them. So V1 and V2 are connected, uh, but V6 and V2 are not connected. Let's check V6 and V2 are not directly connected uh, with, uh, through an edge. Right? So that's, that's some basic uh, ways to think about these, uh, about these graphs. Um, and in this particular graph, by the way, there is no, it's not allowed to have a connection to the node itself. Um, but this is sometimes uh, done if the, this network represents some kind of flow or some kind of process. Uh, yeah, so this I would not call a complex network. So a complex network has many, 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 many nodes and often also many, many edges. Uh, of course, it's not really possible to say now it's a complex network and now it's no longer a complex network, but um, um, this is a, a rather simple network. Uh, there's also this thing, which is actually a statistical model, um, and uh, these are often called uh, Gaussian graphs, Gaussian network graphs, or the Gaussian graph model. Uh, and the, 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 the idea there is, that that's, that's really the connection here with this uh, matrix representation, is yeah, if you have something like a correlation matrix or a covariance matrix, then there would be correlations in here. You can, of course, imagine you can put a threshold on the correlations, only look at the significant ones or something like that, um, and make those into ones. And then you can have sort of a uh, uh, you can create a network out of your correlation matrix or out of your covariance matrix. So that's a statistical uh, 
model of, of, this, uh, of this matrix, which could represent some um, uh, uh, degree of association between nodes. Um, but that is, that is a little bit different from the way uh, that, um, and so if you're talking about uh, network science, they usually do not include these statistical models. But in uh, psychology, they are right now very popular because yeah, they are used to, um, to study uh, psychopathology. So there are different types of graphs. Uh, this is the sort of graph that I just showed you. It's an undirected graph, which means there's no, you know, you can go anywhere, basically. There's no, uh, there are no one-way streets here. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah. So uh, uh, there, there are uh, lots of lots of different terms. I'm just uh, showing you some. Uh, a simple graph means it's a, it's a graph which has no loops in it, right? So here there are. Yeah, you really have to. You cannot make a make a make a make a loop here. Um, uh, directed graphs they usually do have loops. So uh, here you have. The graph can refer to itself, or the node can refer to itself. This can be because it's like uh, it represents time or something, or because uh, or it could be an outer correlation or something like that. Um, but here you have these one-way streets and, and and directions, and so sometimes you in these networks you can end up somewhere and don't go out anymore. This kind of thing can be a topic of uh, research. But it's interesting once you have a directed graph. And you make this table. So here are four vertices, right? Um, so V1 can loop back to itself. There's a one here, so that's correct. Yep, loop can loop back to itself. But um, it now, uh, now there's a difference between the rows and the columns if you look at uh, how many connections uh, these uh, edges have. So, so V1 connects to V1, okay. Uh, 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 not to, um, there's not an incoming connection from V2. So, so here the columns mean incoming connections. Uh, there is an incoming connection from V3, uh, but not from V4. But if you look at, uh, at the rows, right, there is an outgoing connection to V2. So the rows here represent outgoing connections, the columns represent incoming connections. How many connections a node has is called the degree of this node. Yeah, so for undirected graphs, you have just count how many edges connect to this node. For um, <coughs> a directed graph, you have an in degree and an out degree. But you can also sum them up and, uh, and have a total degree. Uh, so this would be the total degree of this network. So and uh, usually they, uh, they take an average and so divide it again uh, by the number of, um, of nodes. Uh, well, these, these types of graphs have lots of uh, applications, um, very important ones like, like how, uh, logist in logistics for companies, but, uh, but also maybe not so important, but oh, quite fun. <laughs> Let me go back. So this, uh, it's a directed network of the effectivity of Pokemon attacks. If you have a psychic Pokemon, you can uh, do some attacks. I actually don't know how this card game works, but uh, apparently you can make a graph of it and then figure out what, uh, what to do if you encounter some grass Pokemon or a ghost Pokemon. Um, yeah, it's a directed graph. Um, so we have undirected which has uh, a degree, which is just uh, counting the edges. You have directed graphs. This is actually a kind of specific directed graph, which is only flowing in one direction. But you know, usually, you can also have connections coming back. Uh, and these graphs will have an in degree and an out degree. And then we have, of course, a weighted graph. So in this matrix, you do not have to put uh, in there just a 1 if there's an edge. You can put in a number. And this number can represent a level of association, but it also can represent, if you're thinking about uh, maybe um, transportation networks, I don't know, how many flights are there between cities, how many trucks are on this road, all those kinds of things uh, can be included as a, as a weight. 
And then if you uh, look at the degree, often uh, there are some other measures. So, that, so, so for instance, uh, if, if you have a weighted graph, you can also calculate something called the strength of the node, which is then a summation of the weights of all the edges that are coming in. So not just a number, but a summation. That's the case here as well. This is the sum of all the weights of the nodes for coming into um, node A. OK, so that's not even everything that's possible, but these are the most common, uh, common things that you will encounter. Uh, and yeah, of course, weighted graphs can also be directed. Uh, so you can have weighted directed graphs. They would look something like this. <coughs> uh, this these, these numbers could, uh, for instance, uh, uh, implicate the, 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 the probability that this edge will be traversed, that's sometimes what it means, um, uh, or, or the difficulty uh, of traversing an edge like that. But it can also uh, mean something completely different, which has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the flow of information through the network that uh, can represent, uh, again, how many trucks are on this road or something like that. OK, so this is uh, would be, uh, I think this is a computer network of a company. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> forgot to put up what it is, but uh, it's at least a global uh, global network and it's a weighted directed graph. I think it's uh, a logistics map of, um, of, uh, of what, uh, how they uh, distribute their products. So many, many, many things, disconnected graphs, simple graphs have no loops, non-simple graphs have loops. Uh, you can figure out whether the particular connections in a graph are actually the same. So this would be like an equivalent graph. Uh, signed graphs, right? if, the, if the edges mean, uh, uh, represent correlations, you can have negative connections, positive connections, uh, supportive, opposing stuff, uh, complete networks, uh, all kinds of different <coughs> uh, characterizations of the topology of these graphs. So of the structure of these graphs. And different structures mean different properties. Yeah. yeah so why does it matter whether a uh, network is complex or not? Why, why, why does it matter? Yeah. Uh, there are certain properties that are very interesting that only occur in complex graphs. But uh, it turns out that if you look in nature, and if you want to describe things in terms of the graph theory, they are mostly very complex. <laughs> so the internet is an, is an example, but uh, that, that's a very complex network. But I'll show you that uh, also social networks um, can be pretty complex. But, but uh, you can go to any scale. Uh, for instance, um, like the, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, the networks that uh, in your body that, that, uh, that um, represent how, uh, for instance, uh, energy is, is, is made out of the, out of the acids and out of the, out of the stuff that you, uh, nutrition networks, the, the chemistry of nutrition, that, that those are very complex things with which very many different steps and nodes and those kind of <coughs> So in nature, there are really a lot of complex networks. Think about uh, airline traffic. Right, so that's that's around the globe. It's also a huge network, and and yeah, as they as they become larger and larger, they get some interesting properties. Some of which we have already uh, discussed, and, uh, but I'll show you. Uh, uh, I'll show you what those properties are. Mm -hmm. First, of course, let's let's look at some examples. Oh, yeah, I to put up again. but uh, so you can look this up. It's, it has a uh, this is a, a way to figure out. Um, uh, what beer to take. <laughs> so, so here are the beers listed, and if you press one you like, then it suggests, oh, then you might like that one as well. Uh, and, and this one may be nice to look at. Uh, this is, uh, oh, yeah. this is, probably have Game of Thrones in Finland as well, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, 
a website in which they uh, uh, had like uh, they, they, I think they, they, they this is based on the books rather than the um, than the movie, but uh, of the, 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 the series, but they. Yeah, <laughs> connection here means, so a, a circle here is a person, and a connection means that one person kills the other one, <laughs> which happens a lot in this series, right? And if it's black, you're dead, and oh yeah, the size of the vertex uh, tells you something at, of, of how often they, uh, they appear actually in the, in the, in the books, so, uh, so this moves. Uh, Long. So, but why am I showing you this? This, this does give you an idea um, of what it might look like to have like a time flowing right in, in one of these networks, and how these networks might change over time. So, very often you see uh, <coughs> uh, you see uh, people make animations uh, uh, of the changes of the structure of these networks. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it, 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 again, it's, it's a mathematical theory, so, so what nodes and edges represent, that's up to you, basically. Right, so uh, uh, the theory itself does not really uh, dictate uh, what can be an edge or what can be a node. Um, oh, right, yeah, this might also be interesting. So I told you about um, these uh, different uh, theorems, of course, that you need for uh, studying complexity. One of them was the Axel's anti-foundation axiom, um, <coughs> which is a, a theory about non-well-founded sets, which means that you can have the definition of a set can contain itself, right? So this would be uh, uh, the regular case, right? So you have a set that refers to things and their unique elements. Um, uh, but then th these kinds of things would, would generally be uh, not allowed, right, by the general set theory. This would be allowed, I think, but those things would not be allowed. And then the hyperset theory, or the, the, the impredicative, uh, uh, oh yeah, so I have to say it differently, the, the anti-foundation axiom sort of sparked also uh, um, uh, a different branch of uh, graph theory, which is called hyperset graphs. And they look something like this. <clears throat> so this was an attempt by uh, by Rosen, who uh, was uh, was uh, tasked by the NASA, in, I think in the 70s or maybe in the 60s, to give a definition of life. Because yeah, if you go out in the, in the universe, you have to know what life is. And his attempts were very interesting because he tried to to do this in a in a logical way, but he very quickly realized that it's really not possible to do this with set theory. You really need something else because you have all these feedback loops uh, uh, coming in, and, and in graph, in hyperset theory, they are called uh, hyperset loops of, or impredictable loops. Okay, so let's start <coughs> with um, um, something that's actually quite uh, quite old, an application: um, the social networks. Uh, what's very interesting is there, there are a, a number of these network disciplines that have evolved relatively independently of one another. So they also developed their own language. So you, you, now we're stuck with uh, like three or four different terms for the same measure. <laughs> but that's just because they came from, from different uh, contexts. Uh, and social networks is, is, uh, is uh, pretty, uh, pretty old. Uh, this is a sociogram from the 1930s, apparently. Um, uh, the, the, this is a classroom, and then um, the question is, uh, uh, report the three uh, kids you most like and the three you most dislike. Um, and, uh, well, you can represent this in, uh, in, this, uh, in this graph, and uh, you can imagine that this will become a directed graph. Right? So one ch child can say, I like you, I like you, I like you, so a kid can have like incoming positive connections, but also maybe uh, incoming negative, and, and if they nominate somebody, uh, I dislike you, that would be an outgoing uh, connection. And so, but <coughs> we're only look going to look at the positive nominations um, here. Uh, and so this is, the, the, this is this classroom, and um, the, 
the white dots, I think, are the boys. Girls. Uh, the girls. The black dots are the, are the boys. Uh, this is from the 1930s, right? So uh, that's, the, that's the distinction that they thought was important. Um, but um, if you look at the, the nominations here, uh, you can see some interesting things. For instance, it, uh, there appears to be a really like a segregation, right? Uh, because <coughs> you have a network here that is relatively independent of the network here. There are a few very important, important nodes here, uh, 19 and 20. Where is 19? 19 receives, uh, uh, is one of the most central nodes. It has a very high degree, many in incoming uh, nominations for number 19, but not just from the own group, but also a connection to the other group, to the other network. So eight nominates 19. And number 20, is 20, is from the other network. And uh, this one receives, or, or yeah, this is a reciprocal uh, um, uh, nomination. So, so actually 8 and 20, and maybe here 14, uh, are three nodes that are actually the, the people who who keep these two groups together, right? So those types of nodes have, an, have a name, and they are called hubs, hubs. So they are very important nodes in these networks, and usually they have something to do with, uh, with keeping uh, sub-networks together. Uh, yeah, we also have some isolated nodes. So eight does not receive any nominations, and 10 also does not receive any nominations. <coughs> this actually might be a nice tool for if you're a teacher, right? uh, because yeah, this might not at all be apparent if uh, if you're just observing these kids interacting with one another. But, but uh, yeah, it might mean something that, that there's no nominations coming in for these two kids. <coughs> um, now this is just looking at it descriptively, but yeah, we can we can do some counting, we can do some <coughs> some analyses in order to, um, to um, uh, characterize the structure of this network. Mm. And the, the kind of uh, measures that you get out of this are the most common measures. Degree, we already talked about that. Centrality is a kind of measure which uh, uh, counts, um, let's say, uh, in how many steps can you get to a node. So what's, what are the shortest paths? And, and then the node with the shortest path and, and the most incoming connections would be the most central node in the network. And closeness and eccentricity have also something to do with you know, how, how long does it take before you get there. Uh, between us, uh, how many uh, edges uh, uh, are maximally between them, between nodes. And there's a whole zoo of those kinds of measures. But, um, uh, another another uh, way that these uh, networks are, are used is to, to indeed figure out whether there are sub-structures, whether there are sub-networks. And the only thing we did here is we have, so this would be like the original matrix. The only thing we did here was just sort it uh, on this variable uh, boys or girls. And then you can see there are indeed, you know, some nodes. That, uh, so so this, is, uh, this is a sub-network. Here we have nodes connecting to one another. Here we have nodes, and there are just a few that are actually here, uh, which are which which are the, the nodes responsible for that. There's there's uh, uh, any connection at all between the two groups. Uh, these yeah, this would be called clusters or communities or subgraph or modules. This all depends on which discipline you are from, and there are many different uh, techniques to figure those uh, figure those out. And 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 these uh, connections here what we call hubs or connector hubs. And I think the most general term would be community detection. Uh, but there, you can do many, many more things. Uh, there are analysis that can, can sort of figure out um, uh, for triads or sometimes for more uh, complex patterns as well, um, uh, whether they are balanced or not, right? So. For instance, if these are kids and you have uh, uh, the situation where everybody likes each other, well, no, that's okay. 
Um, but you can also have these triads where the dislike of one uh, towards another uh, stresses the relationship of uh, the positive relationship they have because B does like C, but A does not like C. Right? So, and then you can have all these different uh, combinations of triads. And, and um, yeah, you can sort of summarize this for the network. And if you have, uh, if you have like, a lot of these uh, stress relationships, then it's usually an uh, indi indication, at least in social networks, that something uh, might be uh, uh, going on uh, that you might want to take care of. And these things are called motives. And in this case, they are signed motives. So here's another example in which this actually uh, uh, was used. I think I don't think actually companies would use this, but this is used in some uh, some study, uh, which is uh, of a, I think a plant where they they are on strike, and uh, and there's a, there are union uh, negotiators. These two. And then it uh, turns out that, uh, that the people in the plant uh, are, of course, also distributed. Uh, this is from the US, so um, distributed into, uh, into groups uh, where this might be people with a Latin background, probably. I don't know what the difference here is, but uh, what you can see is here also. So Bob basically is the connection to this subgroup, to this community. Right? If you lose, if you lose Bob, <laughs> this network would be completely disconnected from uh, from the rest. So now, suppose you are not a worker in this factory, but a manager. <laughs> you might want to set Bob on a vacation, maybe, right? If you want to cause distress. Uh, and and here we have uh, this connection here. Norm also uh, is basically connecting. Well, we have Aussie, but but Norm and Bob here are really the the, the the connector hubs that keep this together. Um, yeah, so visualizations like this might actually be used um, to, uh, uh, yeah, to, 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 to have interventions or uh, to get an idea of who to talk to if you want to negotiate. Because these union negotiators, they, they, they better uh, make sure that Bob is on their team, right? <laughs> because they, Bob has access to everyone. Um, okay, here are some more examples. This is, a, this is something that looks much more like a complex network. Right? It's still a social network. This represents, um, this is a, I think a study in uh, eating behavior. We have obesity and then the uh, links that, um, and the connections that people with uh, diagnosed obesity have with family, friends, marriage, or with non-obese people, I think one of the purposes of this study was to, to show that this uh, uh, environment, varied environment, is, is helpful to, uh, for, uh, to to deal with this um, with this disease. And then now we get to really complex networks. So this is the internet, the connections of the internet, mapped by uh, IP address, and this is just a part of the of the internet. So routing path so through a portion of the internet. So this thing here is, is there, <laughs> right? So <coughs> it's a hugely complex uh, thing. So, so these are really complex networks, right? And that's a little bit different from a classroom or from a, um, a plant. So yeah, like I told you, there's uh, um, a whole bunch of uh, complexity measures associated with these things. Some of them actually do, do sort of refer to some of the things that we talked about, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, but, uh, but some of them also are, are very specific for uh, network models. Uh, and I think the most important ones I already uh, discussed. So you can have clustering, you can have uh, communities that are connected by hubs. Um, yeah, path lengths are important. Um, and, and those are basically the, 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 the most uh, interesting uh, uh, things to know. Of course, these are all things you can calculate. I'm just putting this up here to show you that most of these things, just like with recurrence quantification analysis, are summations of things and then taking a proportion or a mean, right? So 
they are not really uh, very complex things, but um, uh, what is especially a little bit more complex here is that uh, to figure out what is the shortest path, you need an algorithm that is able to do that. So it has to go through all the connections and to do this as efficiently as possible, that's, that's usually the, the, uh, the topic of, uh, of uh, research in computer science and mathematics. Okay, so now let's go to some of the interesting properties that especially these very complex networks have. And this is something you probably will know of, because it's a very popular uh, thing. Uh, the, it's called the small world topology. And the first time this was mentioned was uh, by uh, Watts and Strogat. Uh, so not that long ago, I mean, it's, uh, uh, in terms of uh, mathematical years, of, or uh, years of mathematical discovery, let's say. Um, so what they calculate are two measures of a network, uh, the average path length and the clustering coefficient. So uh, uh, how, uh, what is the probability, this clustering coefficient, what is the probability that a node will connect to a node that, is, uh, uh, that has the same degree as, it's, it, as it has? That uh, tells you something about how clustered the network is. Um, and interestingly, what they, what, so, so they test this on, on of course, a little bit of uh, toy models. Um, and it turns out that, um, so let's look at these models. So here you have a model that is completely fully connected, right? So each node in this network has the same number of degree, so the same number of connections. Every node is connected to uh, every other node. This is sort of the, the opposite, where you have uh, kind of a random, random distribution of uh, connections. You can see there are some that have uh, many connections and some that only have uh, a few connections. So the, the distribution here is just a normal distribution. So you have nodes, you have a lot of nodes with a particular number of connections and there are just a few nodes with, with very little connections and a few nodes with a lot of connections. <coughs> there is some, some and you can calculate these things like average path length and clustering coefficient, that's what's displayed in this graph, uh, for these uh, net networks, for a number of these. This is indicated by the number of P, so that's what you see here. So you can create a different number of uh, these things. Turns out that the most interesting networks are right in between. And what are they right in between of? We've seen this before. They're right in between something that is extremely constrained. Think about the Brownian motion, like the, the random walks, right? Very highly correlated. We know what's going to happen at the next point in time. Maybe not at, at, at very long, but, but it's extremely constrained. And somewhere in between, something that is actually completely random, randomly connected. And it turns out that uh, this state in between is um, is a state, well, that's, that's, you might say that's not, not, not a good property, but the, the reason they started to look into this was the, was the model of disease spreading. So how, how does a virus spread across the globe, basically? Uh, and it turns out that if a network has the properties uh, of these things, so not everything is connected, which might be kind of counterintuitive, because you would think if everything is connected, then why, why doesn't this virus spread efficiently. That turns out not to be the case. You have to have something in between. And, uh, and they call this the, the small world uh, topology. So sound familiar, it's in between fully ordered and completely random. And that would be the optimal, uh, the optimal configuration. So we can, we can uh, look at this. Uh, because it turns out, if you if you want to calculate, uh, um, for instance, the relationship between how many nodes there are in this network and how many connections they have, and you, you order them, it turns out that these these very complex, interesting networks, which have these uh, which have this small world property, the relationship between nodes that have many connections and how frequently they occur is actually a power law distribution, right? So 
So there's a connection here to the, the things that we talked about on, on Tuesday a little bit, about detecting uh, scaling and, uh, and, and the, the interesting things about scaling. And, and, and networks that are actually quite simple and don't have these, the small world property, um, they have a distribution that looks a little bit like this, so the, you know, more like a, a normal distribution. So these scale-free uh, 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 small world networks are also called scale-free networks. So what are these properties? Why is this so interesting? Um, here we have, oh, by the way, and, and, and the, the, the things that have this normal distribution are called random networks. Here you have a random network, so uh, um, uh, highway networks between cities, they are often uh, behave like these random networks and, um, and like airplane uh, movements, uh, airplane uh, networks, they, they are more uh, like these scale-free uh, networks. And the, the most important thing is they are much more resilient to random attacks. So if you have a random network, so these are all nodes, and suppose this is you know, just roads, right? Roads connecting cities. If you have nodes that fail, and you cannot you know, randomly in this network, um, this means that, that, that these networks will immediately fall apart in different sub-networks that are not connected anymore. So you cannot, if you are here, you cannot get to this node anymore. You cannot get to that node anymore because there is no connection anymore. But in the scale-free networks, so here we have a scale-free network. If you, have, if you take out the same nodes here, so the same cities here are gone, it's still possible to get, get from one node to any other node of the network. Right? And that, that's, that's really because, the, because of the way that these uh, networks are structured. So an example is <coughs> in, uh, on 9-11, um, when these, uh, the World Trade Center was attacked, in the US, there were more, more uh, damage to more buildings uh, around the World Trade Center. And one of them was where the, the huge cable that is on the Atlantic Ocean connecting uh, the, all the uh, internet traffic from Europe to uh, the US was uh, coming in. There are more of the, these things, but this was one of the largest um, uh, cables that are on the floor. And, and that building was destroyed also. And there's this company that uh, takes track of the uh, speed of the internet, so they track how long it takes for when you send an email, right? And this is split up in packages, it goes around all the routers, and then when it arrives, uh, yeah, this takes an amount of time, and if there's an internet company, if there's a company that tracks this, uh, this uh, yeah, speed of the internet, so to speak. So half an hour after this connection was lost, the speed of the internet was back as, as normal. And this is not something that somebody did, so there was no one that flipped the switch or something. This was just these packages reorganized and found a different route, and this route was just as fast as the, uh, as the route that, uh, that they used to take maybe uh, when this thing was still, uh, was still uh, present. Right, so that's, that's, also, uh, that's also what you would call self-organization. So the, the, the network, or the way the network is traversed by everybody sending an email, is actually uh, uh, self-organized, found different routes, and in the end you did not, after half an hour already, you didn't know any difference. So how do you take out a scale-free network? Well, I already alluded to this. If you know where the hubs are, and you take out hubs, then you will get the same thing as, as here, that you have uh, disconnected parts of these networks. But then the trick is, of course, yeah, you have to figure out where are the hubs. So this is also this, this idea that you can get very easily from one node to another in a very short number of times is related to something you might know, um, which is the six degrees of separation. Have you heard about this? Yeah. I think everybody knows what it is. Uh, also sometimes called uh, to, to, to show what this is, the Kevin Bacon number. Um, uh, and I think this is, uh, they looked at which people are on the, on the credit roll of films like Kevin Bacon, and then through that everybody is connected to everybody. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, we can do this a little bit. We can, uh, we can do a little, uh, 
test here. So maybe what is your degree of separation from, we're at the university, right? What is your degree of separation from a Nobel laureate, do you think? Somebody who won the Nobel Prize. Yeah. How many steps? <laughs> I, I, I met one guy in, the, in Espoir by an accident. Yeah. And I had a chat who had won the Nobel. That was interesting. Yeah, and I, I, I know you. Yeah. So well, one for two steps. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that's how it works, right? Uh, you could add some extra constraints, right? So it, would this guy remember you if you met him again? Or something like that. But mm. we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll met, or, or at least there's evidence that you met or something. So, so usually at universities, this, this is very quickly one or two steps at your near a Nobel laureate. Okay, do you know who Pharrell Williams is? Yeah. So how many steps are you uh, separated from Pharrell Williams? Last, last time I had someone who, who, who knew a friend of him. <laughs> so, so that was easy. But, but how, how many steps do you... You have to think about where, where should I go. I'm just hearing this tune in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Happy. Let me help you out a little bit. So this is me, like at least 20 kilos ago, um, <laughs> with my friend uh, Tekla. And Tekla actually went on to, she studied psychology, social psychology, uh, and cultural psychology, but she went into uh, the advertising business and uh, she worked for this uh, jeans company, and uh, well, this jeans company had Pharrell Williams as uh, their main uh, commercial person. So, so for me it's it's uh, maybe two, and for you it's now three because you know me, right? Very quickly. Um, what about uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Never met, never met these people. Well, here again, we have Tekla, and that's, of course, Hillary Clinton. Uh, so it's, uh, well, and then, of course, it's a very small step to this guy. Uh, so, yeah, so you have, like, uh, now you have two or three steps, uh, also a separation from Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, of course, if you know one of those people, well, yeah, then you know the world, basically, right? So. So very often, um, these six degrees of separation are an overestimate. <laughs> very often, it's much shorter. The only problem is you need to know a hub. So in this case, Tekla is my hub, and I'm now your hub. But uh, if you don't know them, then, then it might take a little bit longer, of course. Uh, yeah, so, um, so it, 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 this, this, you can play this game, but it's almost always the case that you, that you don't need more than six steps to get to anyone in the world. And that's really a property of these scale-free uh, networks. Uh, yeah, these are just some examples. So let me check the time. We are 20 past 11. Yeah. So maybe I can spend the last 10 minutes talking about these recurrence networks just after I've told you about this, about an application. Um, so forget about all these things. But here you have um, a study on um, Alzheimer's disease in which they, this is an MEG study, so they, uh, they, uh, they created networks out of the locations, right? So the locations of the, of the recordings of the brain activity. Um, are the nodes, and then how, st how strong the signal is connected to um, to other sites is what makes the edges. And so you have the weighted network of these um, of these uh, well brain recordings. And in fact, these are not. Uh, this is not during the task, but this is just um, when people have their eyes closed and they make some for some amount of time they make a recording, actually pretty short, a couple of seconds, and then they get these uh, networks out. Um, and so what they found out is what is, what, what is the main difference between the structure of the networks of Alzheimer patients and uh, healthy uh, age controls is it turns out that Alzheimer's disease targets hubs. 
So, it, so, so these uh, these networks are characterized by yeah, hubs being taken out. So somehow this disease is able to figure out what the important nodes are, and then go there and and, and take those out. Um, so it's not a random attack of of the structure of this network, but it's uh, it's a targeted attack, and it's it's uh, it's it's hubs. And so I found that a very interesting uh, uh, result. So now let's go. We're skipping the psychological networks a little bit. Let's go to the recurrence networks. 